Knight Rider won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about Candyman. Candyman, 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 can. Who can make the world smile? <laughs> well, I think the, it may be. I think the Candyman can. Sprinkle it the love, make the world go round. The Candyman <laughs> can. Uh, I, I will admit, before we watched this, I saw this in college, I think, and I really I remember not liking it very much. I don't know why. Yeah. Because watching it again now, it's really good. It's good, yeah. I wasn't a huge fan. It wasn't one of my, you know, a, uh, annual spring season right. viewings. But yeah, it's a very different movie. It's a very. Especially thanks to Philip Glass, it's a very gothic. <laughs> oh, it's like so a good. New York or Chicago-based Southern Gothic thriller. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I originally, I remembered. I thought it was in New Orleans. Not New Orleans. I thought it was in yeah. Louisiana. I thought. I think I got it mixed up with Hatchet, the Hatchet series. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's in Louisiana. Yeah. Oh, 100 yeah. percent. Because I, uh, I had a horror script for a while, and my writing partner and I kept going to these. B movie premieres and stuff to try <laughs> yeah, to like meet yeah. people to tell our, our script. And we went to what was supposed to be a, a, a hatchet screening of the original hatchet, I guess. Right. And it had all these scream queens and stuff there that we're trying to connect with. And, and then when we got in, we found out, ooh, no, it was a special premiere of the new Hatchet 4 or whatever. And oh, I was, yeah, yeah, that's seen right. any of the other Hatchet movies. I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> but the one thing is one of your boys from uh, Impractical Jokers was one of the stars. Oh, really? In Hatchet 4, yeah. Oh, really? Good, Weird. Good death. Okay. Yeah. The, the dude with the beard, the kind of chubby guy. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the dark hair. Yeah, he's the nerdy comic book guy. Yeah. yeah Q. He was, I think it's Q. He was part. It wasn't a horrible movie, but I think I get those... A lot of these movies tend to kind of, you know, roll into each yeah. other after a oh, while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But like you said, again, seeing it again, it, it was really good and very different. I also thought for some reason it was directed by Wes Craven. I was all off no, on this no, movie, 100%. You were totally off. I thought, I thought Bill Cosby starred as the Candyman. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, technically he kind of is. <laughs> Pudding pop. Pudding yeah. Pop. Uh, yeah. I, I just, I really love this movie. I think a lot of it, this is a perfect, perfect example of how a score can really just burn a movie into your brain. Yeah. Because as soon as the score started, I was like, okay, now I remember. And yeah. The, well, Philip Glass so good. is a genius. Yeah. And also, I know we're going to talk about it, but again, the, one of the first uses of the uh, bird's eye POV. Yeah, the sky cam. Yeah, you know, where that steady shot where they just do a bird's eye view of all the buildings and stuff. Yeah, that f- that first time where you're like, how the hell did they get yeah. that shot? Yeah, it's it's probably, we were talking about it, it's probably the most copied shot oh, yeah. after Hitchcock's pull, zoom, push, pull, switcheroo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks to Marty Scorsese. <laughs> I've used the, <laughs> uses, yeah, that yeah. shot quite a bit. It's effective when yeah. you do it right. It's very effective, yeah. Oh, man, when I was in film school. <laughs> Every it was like, oh, it was where's like, it coming? Right. When's it coming? I need somebody to help me pull focus. Uh, uh, it was really impressed with the people who did it in animation. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's uh, it was really well directed, really well shot. Uh, a very interesting killer, a very sympathetic. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, yeah, it wasn't yeah. just a soulless, immortal killing machine like right. Jason or. Freddy or no, he's you know. more like Dracula than he is anything else. Yeah, I mean, he definitely had a backstory. He definitely had uh, reasons for grievance. Uh, <laughs> you know, he wasn't. He was treated horribly. I mean, it. And plus, it was one of the first horror movies to really, in a serious way, kind of deal with racism yeah. and racial history and the projects. And it was very groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, you know? yeah, it was. Uh, it was interesting. All right, well, take yourself back to yeah. 1992. Uh, August 24th to the 28th, Hurricane Andrew hits South Florida and Louisiana and dissipates over the Tennessee Valley when it merges with the storm system. 23 people are killed. Oh. Yeah. September 12th, STS-47 launches with the first African-American woman to make it into space aboard the Endeavor. Man, it took until 1992? 
Yeah. October 3rd, after performing a song protesting against alleged Catholic Church child sexual abuse, Irish singer-songwriter Sinead O'Connor rips up a photograph of Pope John Paul II on the U.S. television program Saturday Night Live, causing huge controversy. Yeah, um... She was right. A hundred percent right. <laughs> um, she was right. She was a, a forerunner of oh, yeah. blowing that whistle and like nobody listened. Yeah, well, $5 billion in settlements later and counting, uh, it still happens all the effing still, time. Still. I grew up in a Catholic church and uh, we had a couple of abusers. I think I've told the story a few times, but the abuser, uh, he only beat me mercilessly. He didn't sexually abuse me like he did the other boys. But we are pretty sure that when they did the old switch roundy groundy with him, yeah. that he ended up in, uh, in Des Moines. In Des Moines. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had a, a guy who uh, got a little too close to the second graders uh, and had to be shipped off to a Navy ship. He became a chaplain on like an aircraft carrier or well, something. He was going to get him away from kids as much as put him in the middle of the sea. <laughs> Yeah, that won't stop him. Oh, he's well, tenacious. At least then it won't be kids. Oh, God. <laughs> it's so gross. Well, it's welcome to Halloween. Shenado Everything's Connor. awful. Ah, man. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, rest in peace. She just, yeah, she just passed not too long ago. So I. She was I, a dynamo. And she, she was amazing. She was very, very vocal about Catholic sex abuse. And, yeah. uh,. Yeah, I had every time on that, and but 100% right. And uh, I think the, uh, the the funniest part of that story is uh, the David Spade aspect, yeah. where he like grabbed a piece of the picture. Yeah, and had, I think uh, uh, didn't Joe Pesci like put it back together? Joe Pesci hey, the next boom. week, like hey. the first thing he asked was, "You need to tape that picture hey. back together." Yeah, do the Pope. Ah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Candyman. Uh, October 16th, Candyman is released in theaters. Candyman. Uh, s weird thought having an horror movie actually released during October. Yeah. I'm pretty sure every movie we've covered, for the most part, has not been released in October. Well, they started getting kind of wise to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So Candyman started life as a novella called The Forbidden in Volume 5 of the anthology series The Books of Blood by Clive Barker. You know, I... I'm not a huge Barker fan. I've tried to read a few of his novels, and I haven't been able to get through them. But I do – his short stories, I've enjoyed some of his short stories. Yeah. I've read a couple of these volumes. I don't – I did not read – I didn't make it to volume five. Yeah. But I did read a couple, and his short stories to me are more palatable than his – because some of his Agreed. stuff is long, long, Oh, man. Long. I, I, try, I read The Great and Magic Show uh, because our a friend of the show, Greg, uh, wanted to – he loves Clive Barker. Yeah. Man, I just hated that book so much. Sorry, Greg. Yeah, I tried – I think yeah. Magicka, is that his big old – He did some Magicka, yeah. Uh, or it's Magicka, then I think there were multiple books. Yeah, but the, like the yeah. first one's a thousand yeah, pages yeah. or something. Yeah, I, I had a, same, a similar uh, situation. The friend was a huge fan of his and knew I was a yeah. big King fan and – you know, it's just not the same. I mean, I, although I will say, I feel like Candyman makes Clive Barker look better than his other adaptations. Oh yeah, it's the best adaptation I've seen yeah. of his work. Um, I mean, I I'm I not, mean, I, I do really Hellraiser's like Hellraiser. Okay. I like it's okay. Hellraiser. I just I don't. I feel like this captured his themes better than Hellraiser did, which is ironic because he directed it. <laughs> but you know, right? <laughs> uh, this is the same anthology series that contained the Hellbound Heart that was turned into Hellraiser. The Midnight Meat Train that was turned into a film starring Bradley Cooper and Vinnie Jones. That was pretty good. It was actually r much more interesting yeah. than I thought it was going to be, I am considering not... it's the Midnight Meat Train. Uh, through no fault of his own. Uh, this is all on me. <laughs> I am just not a big fan of Bradley Cooper. He's oh, an insanely yeah. talented guy. Very smart. The guy does fluent interviews yeah. in French. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, you know, he's just, he's great. He's talented, yeah. Unfortunately... Because I think the first time I really saw him was in uh, The Wedding Crashers. Okay, yeah. And that's just who I think he is. He just yeah, seems he was like that, that annoying a like brother. He played a-hole for a while. Yeah. Because like, he's got that look. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's just a testament to how great an actor he probably – that he – just a testament to how great an actor he is. <laughs> See, I can't eat my bias, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed Mid Midnight, uh, Midnight Meat Train, Train and uh, his performance is really good. And again, I'm sorry, Bradley. This is on me. <laughs> it's not your fault. 
Uh, well, it's it's good of him to be able to break out of the uh, that a whole brother character because unfortunately, like Adam Scott could not, yeah. and and never became the leading man. That although no, technically Parks and Rec, he was so lovable. Yeah, he's a much more yes. lovable guy. Yes, he is one of the guys he played that, that can. So he played the asshole so well, though. But he's so good. He's. He he is the one guy that can waffle between yeah. sweetheart and a hole, right. uh, and get away with it. You know, yeah. he's yeah. just really good at both. And I think he's almost better at being a sweetheart. And I think we watched him be a sweetheart for so long on Parks right. and Rec that right. we're probably more attuned to. That's true. But yeah, he played oh Step Brothers. He played a hole <laughs> like a champ. It was so good. Okay, so also included in the Books of Blood anthology series is the Yattering and Jack, which was turned into an episode of Tales from the Dark Side in 1987. Probably saw it. And the Last Illusion, which was turned into the 1995 film Lord of Illusions. Is that the one with Scott Bakula? Correct. Nice. <laughs> that had promise. Yeah. And then it just kind of devolved into a TV movie. It's just yeah, Scott yeah. Bakula, again, very talented guy, but he's a TV guy. He, he is, is like he Tom is. Selleck, a really talented, uh, amazing TV actor yeah. who just could not get the break. No, he just no, didn't totally, have whatever. Totally. And they're very kind of similar guys, too. Yeah, very likable, yeah. handsome, you know, kind of oh, yeah. self-deprecating. They have that same kind of like uh, uh, aura to them, but it's a shame because he was really great. He was great on. I, I never really watched I, the Enterprise I, show. Oh yeah, no, I never really. I couldn't get past the theme song, <laughs> <laughs> but I loved loved Quantum Leap. Oh yeah, like that was I, that was the one show I my parents would allow me to stay up and watch nice. because I loved it so much. It was great. He was great, and uh, yeah, it's just. But they, it, Hollywood never yeah. really got Clive Barker. No, you know? no, no. In fact, he had a, and we'll talk about this more later, but he had a very, very bad reputation in America. Really? <laughs> Clive Barker. Oh, no. Everyone just assumed everything he was doing was blood and guts and gore, and that was it. Oh. And, like, nobody, especially because of Hellraiser. But Well, he was also, bec- also, I think that he there was discrimination against him because he was gay. I also yeah. think that he had a very, one thing I did, you know, I liked about, or like about his books is there's a a, a, a a huge sexual component to yeah. most of them yeah. that weaves within the horror. It's almost like a right, you know, an S and M type of thing in a lot of them. Yeah. But he explores sexuality in horror better than just about anybody else. Right. And and I think that also comes from his own personal oh, yeah, experiences I'm sure. as well. Yeah. yeah. But I think that there was a lot of, you know, Kind of that uh, uh, a residual satanic panic BS. Oh, yeah. That yeah. Uh, really, of course. yeah. You, you know, because his his book, Hellraiser and all sorts of stuff, plus his personality and everything, right. kind of turned him into, an uh, you know, the underground bad boy yeah. or yeah. whatever. I mean, really, honestly, yeah. 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 I, and I think that's one of the reasons why I, I feel like Candyman does a better job than Hellraiser, because I think that, that sexuality is still there. Yeah. It's just much more, uh, not toned down, but like... Uh, it seems to work in the story better than just the like, oh, it's all whips and chains, and right. like this is a kinky thing. It's well, like, he was basically yeah. murdered because he had right. a because he fell in love interracial yeah. relationship, yeah. and then painted yeah. a portrait of his white lover. Yeah, and then you know, oh, not the bees. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Bernard Rose started making Super Eight films when he was nine years old. Uh, by 1975, he won an amateur film competition hosted by BB- the BBC, which led to the broadcasting of his works. He worked for Jim Henson on the last season of The Muppet Show, and then again on The Dark Crystal in 1981. Nice. Didn't they film The, the Muppet Show in they England? They did. They did. They couldn't. Uh, I don't recall. It's in our Muppet Show episode, yeah. but I don't recall why they went over to there. I believe it was just it was cheaper at the end of Something. the day. Something. Yeah. Uh, he attended, Bernard Rose attended National Film and Television School and graduated in 1982 with a master's in filmmaking. After this, he moved on to directing music videos for MTV, one of which was the uncensored version of Frankie Goes to Hollywood's hit, Relax. Relax, don't do it, do it. You can put yourself to it or I something. Don't I don't Relax know. Relax when you want to come. Yeah. Uh, he also did Red Red Wine by UB40. Red Red Wine. Uh, and new, 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 new. Uh, I loved you before. Oh, there was yes, uh, and uh, Small Town Boy by Bronxy Beat. Yeah, another one. Uh, Bronxy Beat is, is so good. Uh, shortly after his production of music videos, he moved on to direct British TV films such as Prospects, a British sitcom, and then finally in 1988 directed his first major full-length film, Paper House, a film that critic Roger Ebert gave four stars out of four and called it 
a film in which every image has been distilled to the point of almost frightening simplicity. This is not a movie to be measured and weighed and plumbed, but to be surrendered to. I've never seen Paper House. I'd like to, but now I do. Yeah. You know, I want to see it. Full throated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> full support yeah, of, from, uh, uh, Roger, Roger Eads. Eads. In 1990, Rose directed Chicago Joe and the Showgirl, starring Kiefer Sutherland and Emily Lloyd. Yeah. Uh, although the movie is set in London, the main character claims he's from Chicago, laying groundwork for the Chicago Mafia to enter the London crime scene. Uh, apparently, Rose was shocked by Chicago's dynamic architecture and open prejudice that he decided to set his next film there. What? Is it fan of prejudice? Oh, yeah. looks like it's very, pre- very uh, prejudicial here. I'm going to fit right in. I have so many. I think it's just ripe for for drama. Yes, I yes. <laughs> it's just yes. I'll uh, fit right in. Uh, that film was adapting The Forbidden by Clive Barker, changing the setting from Liverpool to Chicago. Uh, Rose licensed the rights for the novella directly from Barker after a chance meeting. Oh, hello there, Clive. Hmm. I was wondering. I really enjoyed um, stro- 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 Forbidden. Um, the Forbidden. The Forbidden. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> of something else. Um, I'd like to make it. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> if you if you dare. You got like twenty bucks on you. Yes. Sounds good. In a smooch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, assisted by members of the Illinois Film Commission, Rose scouted locations in Chicago and found Cabrini Green, a housing project notorious for its poor construction, violence, and high robbery rates. Oh, yeah. Uh, the first high-rises were built in 1942, with additional buildings opening in 1957 and 1962. The project was named for St. Francis Cabrini, an Italian-American nun who served the poor and was the first American to be canonized, and William Green, longtime president of the American Federation of Labor. Interesting. What did she do what was her miracle i don't know right. she you gotta have some you have to have three I miracles know. to be canonized is it three miracles yeah, oh. i think so isn't it i don't know i thought they just threw your name in a hat and everyone voted on it no you have to have some sort of divine diddly dupes uh i will look it up and we'll talk about it on the uh stepdad show nice because i don't know i really don't know yeah there's like they're trying to canonize some nun now because she won't rot she just, she doesn't, just won't rot. She's dead. She well, won't. she's dead. She's not going to do any more miracles, so she can never be canonized. But her, her miracle is literally not rotting. Like, okay, what does that prove of the Holy Gospel? Anyway. <laughs> she's so full of Jesus? I, I don't guess. know. I don't know. Full of something. Uh, in 1974, the sitcom Good Times started airing, ostensibly, ostensibly set in Cabrini Green, although the show never calls it that by name. Yeah. It was also one of the first shows set in... Uh, the projects, yeah, and yeah. made it part yeah. of the 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 story, the plot right. line, and and right. you know their existence. It was very groundbreaking, right? Rather than just everyone assuming they were all gangbangers and stuff, it actually showed them being human beings. Exactly, yeah, it showed a crazy. family growing up in Cabrini Green, and right. you know, right. and a very loving and stable and awesome yeah. family, and their yeah. loving, stable neighbors, and Booker. And Booker the Weirdo. <laughs> Maintenance guy. In 1981, Chicago Mayor Jane Byrne moves into Cabrini Green to prove a point regarding Chicago's high crime rate. Considered by most to be a publicity stunt, she stays for just three weeks. Okay, I gotta go. Yeah. This is not for me. Yeah. Not for me. It's funny how every once in a while, it, it seems like every decade or so, some politician's like, well, I'm going to start getting food stamps. Sure. And it lasts for like a week. Right. I'll live on, a hun- on $400 a week. Yeah. And then they don't. No. Uh, I spend it all in like an hour. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, I, I can't buy my champagne anymore. Have you asked how much? <laughs> At its peak, Cabrini Green housed over 15,000 residents. Oh, yeah. In 1995, the Chicago House Authority began tearing down dilapidated mid- and high-rise buildings, with the last being demolished in 2011. Yeah, this was all over the country, too. Yeah. These housing projects went up and were just disgraceful. They were hotbeds of crime and abuse, all sorts of stuff, just people trying to live their lives yeah. in these places that were abandoned by yeah. the police and abandoned Well, that's by... what they, they built them to be as cheaply as possible. Yeah. So, I mean, mostly cinder blocks, like, like they showed in Candyman. Yeah. You could literally just go into somebody else's apartment if right. you wanted to. Well, the thing that was interesting was when they decided to turn uh, 
Virginia Madsen's building into condos. Right. And she right. points out, oh, they covered the cinder blocks. And yeah. Then, and then yeah. It still they made it look same... like it was nice. Yeah. yeah. And the mirror thing is actually a true thing that was I, happening yeah, there. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, yeah. It's super. It, but it, 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 just from the very beginning, it was a bad idea. It was like, let's just make as cheap as possible. Just throw all the people we don't really want yeah. inside these things yes. and then let them fend for themselves. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, it's like, it's awful. Escape from New York. I mean, it's just disgusting. It's very, very high institutional racism. It's, yep. it's great. Uh, the project was also located in between high-class neighborhoods, meaning that the character of Helen, played by Virginia Madsen, could feel Cabrini Green's chaos from a safe apartment not too far away. Cabrini Green's a hard thing to say. It is. Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green. Yeah. This Americanization of the story turned Candyman into an interracial love story where the ghetto residents are now victims of the titular killer. With this change, Rose wanted to showcase those that are living in the poor neighborhoods as regular human beings that are trying to get by, which is why he avoided tropes that are common in most American ghetto stories such as gangs and drugs. Yeah, no, it was interesting. Also, wasn't it the guy that was pretending to be him that killed the people? Like, the one that that, uh, castrated the the kid and stuff, wasn't it the drug dealer guy that actually did that and not Candyman? Probably. Because Candyman seemed like more of a protector of the... Yeah, I mean, it was, although I'm I'm pretty sure he killed uh, Nor- Norma Jean or Ruthie Jean. I'm pretty sure the Candyman killed Ruthie Jean. Oh, yeah. Well, or there was no Candyman, and it was just Virginia Madsen the entire time, and she's crazy. That's also possible. That's how I like to look at it. it was, Ooh, crazy. <laughs> but, she did, but then it would have been hard. Anyway, most likely up until Virginia Madsen is shown on screen, it was probably the guy who confronts her in the... The bathroom right. with the kid that got his wee wee cut off. He's, and then, he took the baby, but he didn't kill the baby. He only killed the dog. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Or unless that was Virginia Madsen. Unless. But I don't think little Virginia Madsen could subdue and decapitate a Rottweiler. Man, if you go into a trance, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> All right, let's try. We'll do saying. an experiment. I'm just saying. According to journalist Steve Bojira, one source of inspiration may have been a pair of articles that he wrote for the Chicago Reader in 1987 and 1990 about the murder of Ruthie Mae McCoy, a resident of Chicago's Abbott Homes housing project. In 1987, McCoy was killed by an intruder who entered her apartment through an opening behind the bathroom's medicine cabinet. Ew. That is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Rose's script garnered a huge amount of attention in Hollywood, attracting a large amount of talent clamoring to work on the film. Virginia really? Madsen, yeah, they, people love the script. Mm-hmm. Virginia Madsen and Tony Todd were the most vocal about being cast in the movie. Cast me in the movie! Uh, so they, he, he, I think he tried to get Virginia Madsen to be cast as Helen Lyle. Uh, she was actually friends with Rose and his then wife, Alexandra Pig. And Madsen was originally to play the role of Helen's friend, Bernie, while Pig was to play Helen. Pig. Yeah. Uh, the choice was made to make the character of Bernie black, so Madsen lost the part. As the shooting was about to commence, Pig discovered that she was pregnant, so the role of Helen was offered to Madsen. Nice. What else has Pig been in? Uh, I don't know. I didn't look it up. I don't okay. know. As far as I know, I not a whole lot of anything. I'm sure she did a lot of British stuff. Okay. Uh, had Matson been able to step into the role, producer Alan Poole was partial to Sandra Bullock as Helen. Okay. Yeah. I mean, she was still very, very new oh, at yeah. this time. She hadn't even... No, she had done Speed. No, Speed was like 94. Was it? hmm Huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Another small wrinkle. Madsen was allergic to bees. Uh-huh. Rose didn't believe her, saying... No, you're not allergic to bees. You're just afraid. So Madsen replied... So I had to go to UCLA and get tested because he didn't believe me. I was tested for every kind of venom. I was more allergic to wasps. So he said, we'll just have paramedics there. It'll be fine. You know, actors will do anything for a paycheck. So fine, I'll be covered with bees. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Your whole life you believe you're allergic to bees and then you get a part and you're like, eh, why not? Well, as a young actor... You do a lot of stuff you probably shouldn't do or that is dangerous or whatever because you want, you know, you're so desperate to. (laughs) That's true. That is true. Do stuff. Uh, They actually bred baby bees, bees that are less than 12 hours old, specifically for the movie as they will be less likely to sting. Uh, Not the baby bees. No. It's so weird to think that all the bees on screen were less than 12 hours old. That's weird. How, what an awful way to be born. All right, bees. (laughs) Now get into Tootie Todd's <laughs> mouth. <laughs> just a well, baby. I don't understand what's well, happening. Just a baby bee. Oh. Uh, Madsen actually started her career in a bit part for the movie Class, starring Rob Lowe and Jacqueline Bissett. Yeah, where 
uh, and also Andrew McCarthy, I think. Uh, yes. And they sleep with each other's moms. Yeah, and Candace like Bergen that. was in yeah. it too. Something like that. Yeah. I don't remember. It's a weird movie. We have talked about class a number of times. <laughs> we're gonna do it. We're gonna do. There's a bunch of people. It was like their first movie for a bunch of people. We're, we're gonna do a lot of. We're gonna do a month of weird teen movies, yeah. and that's definitely one of them. Okay. We could also do ordinary people. <laughs> that was weird. Uh, she was also in the Kenny Loggins music video, I'm Free, Heaven, Help, Heaven Helps the Man, from the Footloose soundtrack. I'm free, Heaven Helps the Man. I don't. I'm free. I literally totally didn't realize that was from Footloose, yeah. and I remember it most from GTA yeah. 5. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly, like, okay. Uh, she played Princess Irulan in David Lynch's Dune in 1985, yes, uh, which I don't remember her in that at all. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's funny. I've seen the most recent Dune, and honestly, I remember more of the original Dune <laughs> than I do <laughs> really? of that Dune. Oh, that's funny. I, oh, the only thing I really remember from the new Dune is uh, Wisconsin Jones or whatever uh, Jason Momoa plays. Oh, yeah. No, Dakota Dakota something. Fanning. Dakota Johnson or <laughs> yeah. Dakota Fanning. He plays Dakota Fanning. He does. Dune. He does a really good job of portraying her. Um, it's like Dakota Smith or yeah, Dakota, Dakota Jones or Dakota Joe or something. I don't know. That's the only thing that he comes flying in it from another make movie. Any sense at all? He, he came in from the Fast and Furious movie to to jump in. And <laughs> well, all he had to do was stretch his arms out and he could fly. I mean, uh, Dune gonna teach you Dunes. Gonna teach you how to fight, Dooner. He used to call him Dooner. Come here, Dooner. <laughs> gonna teach you how to fight, Dooner. Old blue eyes Dooner. Maybe that was his name, Dakota Dooner. Dakota Dooner here. <laughs> hey, hooga doogie. Uh, Matson was also in a series of relative flops throughout the 80s, including Hot to Trot in 1988, starring Bobcat Goldthwaite and Dabney Coleman as the voice of a horse. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that I was really weird. have a weird affection for Hot to Trot because it is not a good movie at all. <laughs> It's such a weird movie. Uh, we'll definitely cover it at some point. <laughs> That's my Bobcat Goldthwait. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I saw him. Uh, I used to see all stand-up comedy I could back when mm-hmm. I was younger. I saw him. I think I've told this story before, but I saw him. Amazing show. Most of the show wasn't him doing that voice. And this was in the yeah. heyday of his yeah. voice. Yeah. But it, his encore was he came out and did Bono and sang. And it was in effing credible. Oh, really? And nice. so surprising because everybody's like Bobcat Gold, Bobcat yeah. Goldthwait, Pops yeah. Trot. Yeah, he's a yeah. goon from from the Police Academy. He's a goon, and he came out and just blew the house down. Everybody wow. was like, "Is this Bobcat Goldthwait?" <laughs> and then That's I met amazing. him years and years later at the the uh, Cine Vegas. Oh yeah, we, we both had films in there. Oh nice. Nice. And uh, met him in the director suite, and he was just the sweetest, nicest guy. And I've told this before, softest hands. Oh, really? Soft, mm-hmm. When I shook his hand, it was like silk, baby. I have never, man or woman, touched a softer hand in my life. Wow, wow. That you go. <laughs> it's, it's good to know. I mean, he yeah. moisturizes, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Takes care of his hands. <laughs> Uh, Madsen was in five movies in 1991, the most notable being Highlander 2, The Quickening. Oh, yeah, baby. That's yeah. another one we're going to have to put mm. on twos that are just as good as this awesome original. Yeah. Is it? No. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> I mean, granted, it has to be better than the original because no! the original is garbage. Oh, no. I can't wait to cover oh, that. Oh, my God. It's garbage. All right. Uh, so she said about Candyman. I'm from Spain, Adam. <laughs> Spanish, I'm a Spaniard. I'm sorry, all I see is trash coming out of your mouth. Uh, Spaniard, the trash. Be only one, and it's going to be a Spaniard. I'm a Spaniard. Uh, Matson said about Candyman. It means a lot to me. It was after years of struggling. As an actor, you always want a film that's annual. It's like A Wonderful Life or A Christmas Story. I just love that I have a Halloween movie. Now it's kind of legend, this story. People have watched it since they were kids, and every Halloween it's on, and they watch it now with their kids. It means a lot to me. The place I get recognized the most is the airport security for some reason. Every person in airport security has seen Candyman. Maybe it makes them a little afraid of me. Yeah, maybe not show your kids until they're a little older. <laughs> maybe your teenagers. 
Yeah, five. Five is fine. Yeah, grab Anything your, less than that. Get some probably... Twizzlers. We're going to watch Candyman. Put his, he's going to disembowel this guy with his hook. Get ready for some nightmares. When they're laying on you scared, just make sure you have your own hook. fake hook. Yeah. And then just slowly rub their little chest or yeah. their cheek. And get a little like snack pack full of bees that you can open up. <laughs> Snoop. Snack pack. A little airplane size pack of bees. Oh, not the bees. <laughs> That's nothing like my single serving bees. <laughs> it's, yeah, you got your, with kids, you got a little bag of Cheerios, and you got a little bag of goldfish crackers, and you got a little bag of bees. Just in case they're bad. The they, bees are for bad they babies. need to know they have to pay attention yes. when they put things in their mouth. All right, you've been bad. Time to put your little hand in the bag of bees. <laughs> <laughs> no, Daddy, No. <laughs> Oh, my Lord. Not uh, the bees. <laughs> Madsen was actually hypnotized during some of the scenes at the request of the director. What? Uh, yeah, like the very first scene when like he see- she sees him and like her eyes like kind of go back. Yeah. Like, she was actually hypnotized. Okay, but couldn't he let her act? Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, is what I, this is what I love about this <laughs> is that supposedly Virginia Madsen and Bernard Rose were friends. And he was like, well, I don't believe you when you come to having a bee allergy. And number two, I don't think you can act. So I'm going to hypnotize you for real. Yeah. Yeah. With friends like that, (laughs) who needs enemies? Eventually, she was extremely uncomfortable doing it. Really? So they stopped. Really? Really? She was uncomfortable with being hypnotized (laughs) and not really knowing what she was doing on camera? Oh, my goodness. This sounds like a... a a violation, <laughs> an OSHA violation of some hey, sort. Well, this, this was in 1992. Uh, there was no hashtag Me Too movement yet. All right, bring in Cormac the Magnificent. <laughs> we need to do another take. <laughs> You're getting very sleepy. Uh, Madsen can most recently be seen in One Day as a Lion, written by Scott Kahn, and also starring Kahn, Frank Grillo, and J.K. Simmons. You know, it's funny, is when I read this, I thought she starred in a film called One Day, Playing a lion. <laughs> was that guy? Yeah. Was it animated? Oh yeah, no, no. It, it was. It's some war movie. A Mormon movie. A war oh, movie. Oh, war movie. Yeah, Mormon movie. It's a, a Mormon, Mormon war movie starring Scott Con. They actually did it, didn't they? Do a Mormon war movie that was with the kid who. Oh was yeah, the, the yeah. It he was, was a hero. Um, he rescued a bunch of guys. He was a he, medic. He was a pacifist. Yeah, and he, he didn't he, carry a gun. Yeah, he, he was just a, ran around and he was a, like he a was thousand a, dudes. Medic? A medic, yeah. Yeah. That was an incredible story. I think... Um, uh, it was the lead... Ki- it was... Uh, Andrew Garfield. Yes. From Spider-Man. Yes. And I think it might have been directed by Mel Gibson. Silence! Maybe. I'm pretty sure it was Mel Gibson. Maybe. Huh? I, no, I think... Uh, maybe. I Yeah. Uh, Tony Todd was cast as Daniel Robitaille, uh, also known as Candyman. Daniel Robitaille. Uh, Eddie Murphy was actually considered for the part of Candyman. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, he's 5'9", and well, he was a bit too short to play the role. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, and of course, no baggage. People wouldn't have been like... <laughs> <laughs> I. The funny thing is, I'm sure Eddie Murphy probably wanted to play the part. I'm sure Eddie Murphy would have been brilliant. Eddie Murphy I, is a... A force to be reckoned with and a talent, but it just it it would be like Bill Murray playing, you know, <laughs> Candyman. Candyman. It just it it'd be tough to oh, get past. Yeah, it was definitely too early in Murphy's career for him to be playing serious parts. Well, he went f- he, he, like maybe this is what turned him into a into a kid star. Is he's like, well, eff it. If they don't let me do Candyman, I'm just going to do a bunch of stupid kids movies. Well, I mean, eventually, he, I mean, a couple of years later, he did Vampire in Brooklyn with Wes Craven. Right. And and that wasn't... turned out really well. <laughs> <laughs> For everyone. Well, you just imagine him in that movie, and that's how he would have been in this movie. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure Bernard Rose made the correct choice. Yeah. Eddie Murphy had a period when he was too big for his britches and just yeah. kind of coasted yeah. through a about a dozen movies. Uh, that was the other thing, is that he was way out of the price range for the budget of the film. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was no way. And I even to the point where when I was working on One Tree Hill on the Warner Brothers lot, like every time Eddie Murphy was shooting a movie, he would take over an entire parking lot. Everyone had to find parking elsewhere yeah. just so he could set up his giant... truck trailer of barbecue like it was literally all he did was make food for himself and his people and it was like taking up like 45 parking spots yeah 
Stars are stars. And I was like, this was like 10 years ago. I was like, are you still? Do you still have that much clout? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, it always smelled really good. I was very sad I could never have any. <laughs> That's about the time that Pluto Nash came out. I Adam. think it was around Pluto Nash, Classic. to be honest. Yeah. And, and Norbit. Uh, Todd actually made his debut in Platoon in 1986. Oh, he was so good. I just want to go back and say I sure. love Eddie Murphy. I, oh, yeah, I'm just yeah, teasing yeah. you, Eddie. I oh, don't, no. You know, you're he one was... of the greatest uh, talents of our generation. I mean, you're right. If he was actually cast in this and they could have afforded him, he would have done well. Sure. I mean, he would have he would have taken it seriously. He would have done, done it perfect. And it, it could have been a, a, a pivot in his career. It could have been something different. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, Todd would later play the character of Ben in the 1990 remake of The Night of the Living Dead, directed by Tom Savini. Oh, he was so good. He was great in that. I actually really, it's one of my more favorite remakes. Tony Todd is, uh, to me, a very underrated actor. Yeah. He, his performance in Candyman is... Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it's just so layered, and it's not so much scary as it is imposing or foreboding, I guess. Yeah, he's just it's just, he's just a presence. Yeah, like it's just you know I mean that first shot where they're in the parking garage and you know the the reverberating voice, <laughs> Helen. Helen, and and she's like what? <laughs> and turns Helen. around and he's just standing back there like, hey, it's time. What's up, Helen? <laughs> it's me, Candyman. I think you're kind of pretty, Helen. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna make your life heck. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony Todd is 6'5 and very physically fit And he recalled that there was skepticism from his colleagues About him playing the Candyman Due to the number of bee sting injuries he would have to receive Oh my god He persisted as he wanted to work with the director and said I met with Bernard Rose Who was a brilliant mind and a great director And I wanted to say it was a hire But I just People kept telling me Oh you'll never be, never be able to shake this And I said you know I'm going to do the best I can, and go away from that. I knew when I read it, and I saw the bees and the stuff, I knew things like that haven't been filmed before. So that was interesting. And I've always wanted to find my own personal Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, it's a, his character's very Shakespearean. Oh, like yeah. It's very, yeah, I mean, the Gothic. King, very Gothic, yeah. yeah. Uh, Todd managed to get into his contract a $1,000 bonus for every bee sting he received. I'll do it, but I need $1,000 for every bee sting that I procure. Uh, he would walk away with an extra twenty three grand from the movie. Oh, just two stings away from that new car. <laughs> for the scene where the bees came out of Tony's mouth, there were actual live bees. No effects were used. <laughs> what a trooper. I, there was a shot where I knew it was him, but there was a shot where like, I was like, no. No, that's like a they made a face yeah. or whatever. But no, no, it's just him. And same with her too. They're crawling all over her <sighs> face. Uh, it took thirty minutes to get all of the bees into his mouth. What a horrible thirty minutes! Ugh. Todd says when they exited his mouth, he was drenched out. While the Candyman's background is unknown in the original story, Todd came up with the character's backstory during rehearsals with Virginia Madsen. Okay, okay, I've got some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> he designated the character Granville T. Candyman. Okay. All right, stay with me here. <laughs> now, I think his name is Granville T. Candyman. <laughs> Wait, his last name is Candyman? <laughs> okay, just stick with me for a while. You'll get it. You just got to stay with me for a few minutes, and you'll get it. <laughs> he, apparently, Granville T. Candyman had a forbidden interracial love affair with a white woman whose portrait he paints, leading to his fatal lynching by an angry mob. Yes, and I don't use paints. I use candy. I, it's, that actually is pretty close to what it seems like is the backstory. It is the backstory. It's just not Granville T. Candyman. No. Uh, <laughs> yes. Granville T. Candyman, just like uh, Michael Halloween. And uh, Jason the 13th. <laughs> and uh, Freddy Nightmare. Yep, so yeah. I'm Granville Candyman. <laughs> the, the, the name of Granville is never used in the, in the first film. So the sequel would address Candyman's origin, and it was pretty close to Todd's vision. Uh, Rose had Madsen and Todd take ballroom dancing lessons together to give them more intimacy on screen. Nice. Uh, Todd tried to act as a primeval boogeyman without overacting the part, which was tricky to do. Yeah, he didn't quite succeed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he worked with Bob Keane on the Candyman's look. Keane first had Todd wear a machine-controlled fake right arm, but found the movements of the arm to be too strict. Then Keane came up with the idea of having Todd wear a hook to indicate the Candyman's supernatural being. Okay. 
I don't know how that indicates supernatural, but okay. Well, it sounds more like a uh, urban legend edition. True, yes, that's true. They hired a blacksmith to make the hook, but when he found out it was for a Clive Barker movie, being a devout Christian, the blacksmith refused to sell the hook to them. Hey, hold on here for just a minute. Are you telling me that this is for a Clive Barker movie? Oh, 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 buddy, no. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I ain't putting my stuff in there. That's for the devil. That's for the devil right there. So I ain't doing it. You can, you're not getting it. You're not getting my hook. I'm going to give it to Jesus. So, that was an actual recording of the message that he left. So Keen spent three hours making the hook himself. <laughs> well, he did a good job. Cup stuck a couple nails through it. It was gross. It was a good hook. Uh, so Todd can most recently be heard in the Masters of the Universe reboot and in Dota, Dragon's Blood, both on Netflix. Who does he play on uh, Masters of the Uni? Um, I believe it's Skeletor. Really? He plays Skeletor, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Is it Skeletor like this? Or is that? Yeah. I thought all oh, like... maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. He probably plays like the that weird dude whose head turns around or whatever. Major face or something. Who's the guy who's got Man all Man at the, arms? Is that no. the guy with the different faces? No, I'm thinking of no. Maybe he plays that weird little cat. Yeah. Juby. He plays the cat. Is his name Juby? <laughs> yeah, Juby the cat. Juby the cat. Uh, he has three projects. I have the power. Yeah, it's you and I'm Juby. To, how, he plays He-Man. Oh, okay. I don't know, <laughs> but I mean, what is He has three projects coming up, including playing the voice of Venom in Sony's Spider-Man 2 for the PS5. Oh, you pre-ordered. I did. Uh, Xander Berkeley was cast as Trevor Lyle, Virginia's wife. Uh, or wife. wife. <laughs> I mean, Virginia's husband. Uh, which is the whole way that setup is weird, because it doesn't seem like they really live together. But they're it definitely actually, married? It did seem like a real marriage to me. Because it was just weird. I, yeah, They're both academics. Yeah. Uh, he's a professor and she's a grad student. And there was some, you know, uh, inter-office BS with him teaching yeah. and her yeah. doing the thing. But Xander Berkeley is one of my all-time favorite character actors. Yeah. I love him so much. There is a great documentary called... That guy from that thing. I think it's something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. And it's and they did also one about women character actors as well. But uh, one of the people that they focus on, and I highly recommend mm-hmm. this documentary because it really highlights some of the best working actors that you know, but you right, don't know. Right. And he was one of the subjects. And he did this uh, like web-based short series where he played the devil, and mm. it took place in this diner, and people would come, and it was so good. And it was so great to see his talents highlighted, because you can see in this movie oh, yeah. what an amazing actor he is. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he is just one of those guys that you know he probably went to school. He's probably got yeah. a master's, yeah. an MFA or whatever. Yeah. You know, he's the guy that knows <laughs> his craft and right. works, works, works as hard as he can. And it's just one of those guys that is an amazing actor. You'll probably recognize him from T2 as the mm-hmm. foster father. He yeah. He gets killed. Yeah. But he always waffled between playing nice guys and dads and bad guys. And he was one of those guys that could, you know, again, just travel between whatever genre, right. wherever character it was, and nail it. He uh, began playing roles in 1981 with early appearances in... MASH, Cagney and Lacey, Remington Steele, Miami Vice, Moonlighting, and The A-Team. His later television roles included... The X-Files, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, ER and Law and Order. On screen, he has appeared in... North Country, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Mommy Dearest, Phoenix, Kick-Ass, A Few Good Men, The Rookie, Apollo 13, Leaving Las Vegas, Gattaca, The Rock, Air Force One... City Nancy, Amistad, Shanghai Noon, Barbar, and Time Code. In 1990, Berkeley appeared in five different movies. They included Internal Affairs, directed by Mike Figgis, and starring Richard Gere and Andy Garcia. That was a good movie. The Last of the Finest, starring Brian Dennehy, Joe P- Joy Pants, Jeff Fahey, and Bill Paxton. A very underrated little sleeper that is something that you should see. I've never seen that. I, I need to check that out. Brian Dennehy's a cop. Yeah. It's really... He's, I've yeah. Brian Dennehy. Uh, he was also in The Guardian, directed by William Friedkin. Don't remember that one. Uh, Short Time, starring Dabney Coleman, Matt Frewer, and Terry Garr. Not a good movie. <laughs> and The Rookie, directed by Clint Eastwood, starring Clint Eastwood and Charlie Sheen. Guilty pleasure. It is so 90s. It, it is, is so, so 90s. 90s. It is incredibly 90s. It's, yeah. a, it's a fun movie. Oh, Sonia Braga's in that, too. No. Yeah. Oh, she's a spicy little Brazilian. <laughs> Later, Xander Berkeley would appear in 27 episodes of the show 24. Wasn't he like the president or something? 
I I think he started as the vice yeah. and then became president or something. Yeah. Uh, 45 episodes of Nikita, uh, based on Lafem Nikita. Right. 14 episodes of Salem, and 15 episodes of The Walking Dead. Yeah, he was great on The Walking Dead. What it was Salem? Was that about it the witches? It was witch about the witches, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was like a modern thing with witches, and then it connected back to the previous thing. Like, it wasn't a period piece or anything. The fact that he's still... Working constantly today, constantly just shows you what an impeccable man, impeccable artist he is, and he must be really great to work with because the guy has not stopped working oh, no. since he started. No. He most recently can be seen in the biopic Reagan as economist George Schultz. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> starring, I'm gonna see uh, that one. Starring uh, what's his name is? Oh God, uh, Quaid. Uh, oh, Dennis, Dennis Quaid. Quaid when Randy my, should have no, been Randy. No. Every time we talk about this movie, I'm always like, "Yeah, well, I did destroy the country." <laughs> uh, he was all, Berkeley was also in an episode of the third season of The Mandalorian. Yeah, he was. I don't remember. I know he. I know he was in it. I sure. don't remember. Well, he's also it. he's like Waldo, man. You yeah. just he'll show up everywhere. It's like, oh, it's it's Andy there's Berkeley. Berkeley. And I now I made a uh, after watching that documentary. I made, because I'm horrible with names. Horrible yeah, Adam. Yeah. You know this. Oh, yeah. Adam, right? It's Adam? No. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, Arnie? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, no. I, made a, a specific, uh, I made a specific effort to remember his name. And luckily, it's Xander Berkeley, so yeah. it's not like... He <laughs> sounds I, like he should be like a, a pinup, like a teen idol. Like, it's Xander Berkeley. Well, he's a guy that needs to have... A leading role in something. I'm yeah. sure he's had yeah. a couple, but I'm I mean, sure. he yeah. needs something because yeah. that, that guy is just one of the best. Vanessa Estelle Williams was cast as Anne Marie McCoy. She was the uh, the waitress that lived in the projects with the the baby. Yeah, uh, she was great in this movie. I I her the character was so good. Just and she wasn't in it a ton, but like she was so good in this. Oh movie. man, when she I mean, look, her role was just absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, because it's like she lost her baby and her dog. And I mean, it was it was a it was a tour de force. I mean, she went through it. It was Uh, Williams began her acting career in 1989, appearing in episodes of The Cosby Show and Law and Order. (laughs) Now I'm on Law and Order. So weird to think that The Cosby Show and Law and Order were on at the same time. (laughs) This is so weird. Well, Cosby started in the 80s and the last It it was even before then. I know, but it's just, I I always think of Law and Order as being a now show. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, it is because it's still been around. For 100 years. In 1991, Williams was cast as Keisha, Nino Brown's gun mall, in the crime thriller New Jack City opposite Wesley Snipes and Ice T. Oh, and don't forget Judd Nelson. (laughs) Don't forget Judd. Oh, how could I forget Judd Nelson? Oh, Jed. I, that, and Chris Rock, too, as yeah. a little crack addict. Uh, yeah. I, that's a guilty pleasure of mine. New Jack. Yeah. Uh, in 1982, she was cast as Rhonda Blair, the first and only black regular character in the Fox primetime soap opera Melrose Place. Yes. There's never been a more uh, obvious uh, jamming in of a minority into an all-white cast, as they did with Melrose a place. So Vanessa Williams was written off the show after, uh, written off Melrose Place after only one season for lack of direction. <laughs> yeah. Williams said later, I think they didn't make the effort to equip themselves to write for a black character, either by hiring a black writer or asking me things. <laughs> 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 yeah. Should we ask Vanessa? Nah, nah, nah. Well, no, 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 no. I know it. I saw I saw every episode of Sanford and Son. I think I know exactly what the voice of the black person is. <laughs> she later had guest starring roles in NYPD Blue and Living Single before she was cast as a series regular in the ABC legal drama Murder One from ninety five to ninety six, created by Stephen Bochco. That was a good show. Yeah. It was every season was a different murder. Yeah. And they would concentrate on it. It was one of the first shows to have like standalone. Right, that kind seasons. of anthology ish. Yeah. Uh, she received her first nomination for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for her performance on Murder One. Nice. In 1996, Williams had a recurring role as Dr. Grace Carr in the CBS medical drama series Chicago Hope, for which she received an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Actress in a Drama Series nomination. Is that still on? No. Chicago uh, Hope? No, no, no. Uh, are you sure? I think it is. No, there's other Chicago shows. Chicago, Chicago Fire Hope is not on. Uh, are you sure it's not part of the Chicago 
No, it's not. Because it's literally... Juggernaut? It's like Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med or something. Uh, like, it's not... There's no more hope in Chicago. <laughs> I don't, I don't think Chicago Hope's still in there. In 2000, Williams was cast as Maxine Chadway in the Showtime drama series Soul Food, a continuation of the successful 1997 film of the same name. Nice. For her performance, Williams won an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Actress in a Drama Series in 2003 and received three additional nominations. She's on fire! Uh, the series aired to 2004 and went on to be the longest-running drama with a predominantly black cast in the history of American primetime television. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Williams can most recently be seen in American Horror Stories, 911, and The L Word, Generation Q. Nice. I'm glad she's still working. She's still working hard. Yeah. Uh, Casey Lemons was cast as Bernadette Bernie Walsh. Oh, Bernie. Uh, Lemons started her career with roles in commercials with McDonald's and Levi's. She made her film debut in Spike Lee's School Days in 1988. Oh, man. That's a musical. Is it? Yeah. I don't that think I've ever musical. seen it. It is not his best movie, but <laughs> it is definitely worth seeing because of the folks that are in it and the yeah. fact that it's a it's a it was one of it, it's probably the only black college musical that yeah. I can think of. Yeah, I mean, I yes. When we do, we're gonna have to do a Spike Month. And oh yeah, we'll, oh yeah. We, you know, we I don't think that's a main one to cover, but we'll definitely watch it. To, yeah, yeah, for the yeah. month. Yeah, talk about it. sure. Uh, she continued acting in Vampire's Kiss in 1989 Ugh. and in The Silence of the Lambs in 1991 before being cast in Candyman. Was Vampire's Kiss, was that the one with uh, uh, Nick Cage? Oh, no. Vampire's Kiss is awesome. I thought you meant the Eddie Murphy vampire. Oh, no. That's Vampire in Brooklyn. Vampire's that's Kiss. That's 1995. Is the best. If Which, that's the, the. Yeah, that's the one. I'm pretty sure that's the one with Nick Cage. Where yeah. he does A, B, C, yeah. D. He, he thinks he's a yeah. vampire, but he's Eats maybe bugs. not. He ate like actually he... ate bugs in the movie. Yeah, yeah. It's one of his great. It's it, it, it's it's unfortunately <laughs> one of his amazing over the top performances that led to a lot of the hmm, question would be movies that he's done, <laughs> but it is with to me it's that raising Arizona, yeah. leaving Las Vegas, and Pig. Those are his. Yeah. Best. Anyway, uh, let's get out of our Nick Cage corner. Yes, go Nick Cage. back to Casey Lemons. Oh, the bees! Uh, not the bees! Yeah, hey, speaking, speaking of great performance, yeah, that's yeah. what I've been doing the entire time. I know, time. I know. I it's Nick Cage had so a, over the top a cage of bees on his head. The Wicker Man, the Wicker Man. Not the bees! No, not the bees! In 1997, <laughs> Lemons directed the film Eve's Bayou, starring Samuel Jackson, Lynn Whitfield, Debbie Morgan, Diane Carroll, and Journey Smollett. That's a really good movie. Have it's a great it? movie. I didn't know she directed it. Neither did I. Uh, Lemons began writing the screenplay for Eve's Bayou in 1992. It was the first screenplay she had written by herself. To convince news that she could direct Eve's Bayou, she filmed Dr. Hugo, a short film based on a selection of the script of Eve's, Eve's Bayou. Eve's Bayou was well-received among critics and won Lemons an Independent Spirit Award for Best First Feature, as well as a National Board of Review Award for Outstanding Directorial Debut. Awesome. Back then, a lot of times, people would make a short film yeah. version to be like as a proof of concept. Yeah. Or a proof of talent. It's still, I mean, people still do it sometimes. Yeah. But it's a lot harder to get <laughs> funding from that kind of stuff now. Yeah. Well, yeah, because the movie business is not, it's not what it was. Not it's, what it was 20 years we're ago. We're in a transition ago, period yeah. that nobody knows how to transition. Uh, Eve's Bayou was the highest grossing independent film in 1997. Nice. In 2001, she directed Samuel Jackson again in The Caveman's Valentine about a schizophrenic homeless man trying to solve a murder mystery. Another really interesting movie. A very underrated movie. Yeah. I, he, Samuel Jackson's great in that Oh, movie. it's an amazing performance. Yeah. In 2007, she directed Talk to Me, which centered around the television personality and activist Ralph Waldo P.D. Green Jr., played by Don Cheadle. Another great movie. What a great director. I didn't know she directed any yeah. of these. Uh, for the film, Lemons received the NAACP Image Awards for Outstanding Directing in a Motion Picture and was named as Best Director by the African American Film Critics Association. Uh, she most recently directed the biopic Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody. Awesome. I, I didn't see I it. Di I didn't see that either, but I had no idea she directed that. Well, she's a very prolific director yeah. and a she's great very artist. talented. Lemons explained during an interview that she considered writing to be central to her task as a director. Baby grading script. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just a joke. 
I've been writing scripts all the time, pretty much every day for 14 years. I have to write scripts because that's the only way I can write parts that will get a lot of people whom I really want to work with involved. Yeah. Uh, Dewan Guy was cast as Jake, the little boy. Jake. Uh, Jake from State Farm. That's who he grew up to be. No, he didn't. (laughs) Yeah, Jake Jake from State Farm. He wears a red shirt and he helps people. Uh, Director John Singleton discovered American actor Dewan Guy in Los Angeles, California at Marla Gibbs Crossroads Theater Academy. You know, I've actually been there and Uh, I've seen it. Oh, really? Yeah, Crossroads. I think I want to say I think I have too, actually. That sounds really familiar. Mm -hmm. Uh, Singleton was so impressed with Dewan's performance in a scene from A Raisin in the Sun that he asked the young actor to audition for Boys in the Hood, which was in pre-production at the time. Oh, man. What a great movie. After taping a scene with Lawrence Fishburne, Dewan became Singleton's first choice for the lead role of Little Trey, but much to John Singleton's dismay, the studio felt that the eight-year-old was too young for the role. Yeah. So they passed. Why? Uh, Dewan was ultimately cast in a lesser role, which was sub- subsequently cut out of the film. Ah. Uh, this makes his role in Candyman his debut at the tender age of nine. He was great. Uh, on set, Guy was referred to as One Take Jake as he finished takes flawlessly. One every, take Jake. Every time. Here comes One Take Jake. <laughs> Just nine-year-olds tromping through. I'm One Take Jake. You better yeah. get out of my way. He's got his entourage with him. <laughs> Uh, Guy and Madsen bonded during production in the scene where they were walking out of the apartment housing project and going over to the restroom. It was freezing cold, and in some takes, Madsen would cover him with her jacket to keep him warm. Oh, how nice. Yeah. Oh, boy. She protected a child. Mm, boy, was she should get the Pulitzer Prize, or she should be made a saint. I'm just kidding. That was very nice. Would you rather she punt the boy yes. across the room? Yeah. Watch him shiver and tell him to suck it up. <laughs> Guy was too scared to watch the entire film the first time at a, for the first time at a screening for the cast and crew. According to an interview for Shout Factory, within minutes of hearing Philip Glass's score in the opening credits, Guy excused himself after his name appeared and requested to be let back in only to watch his scenes. Uh, excuse me. I think this is going to be a little bit too um, scary for me. I'll be out in the lobby eating popcorn and drinking my Coca-Cola. If uh, my scenes come on, could you please just grab me and uh, let me watch them? Just that, though. Please, thank you. Guy continues to act and has made guest appearances in... Boy Meets World, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, In Living Color, Beverly Hills, 90210, Sister, Sister, Murder One, Chicago Hope, and CSI. I wonder if he was on Murder One with... uh, Probably. Vanessa. Probably. Uh, Guy can most recently be seen with a guest part in the movie Dirty Cops LA, Mm. which looks awful. (laughs) It looks really bad. But he's still acting. He's still getting his stuff made. Good for him. Gilbert Lewis was cast as Detective Frank Valento. Detective Frank. Uh, Lewis is best known for playing the King of Cartoons in the first season of the 1986 children's show Pee-wee's Playhouse. Yeah. Uh, Lewis played the King of Cartoons in 13 episodes before being replaced by actor William Marshall. Why was he replaced? I don't know. I couldn't find any information Hmm. on it. Uh, He also made guest appearances on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, General Hospital, and Alien Nation. He's really good. He has he has uh, a lot of gravitas. Yeah, he does in his acting. He's he's very good at playing a cop or an authority figure. I mean, that, the scene where she's like, after she's arrested, and she's like, "I just want to talk to the detective. I want to talk to him." And he comes in, and he's just like, "You have the right to remain silent." Yeah. <laughs> she's like, "What? No, no! Like you're supposed to help me. Tell me what to do." <laughs> and he like screams at her. Yeah, his last role was in 1995 in an episode of Law and Order. Bum, bum. Uh, he passed in 2015 from unknown causes. No, oh, how old is he? He must have been old. It's 2015. Um, he looked pretty old. Yeah. In 1990. He had to have been in his 70s. At least his 70s, if not more. No. Yeah. Uh, Ted Raimi was cast as Billy. Yeah, Ted. Uh, I totally did not recognize him at all in this. I don't, who was Billy? Ted uh, apparently didn't look anything like himself or Sam during this movie, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, he's known for his roles in the works of his brother Sam. He played the hook. A fa- yes. He was a very convincing. Uh, he played a fake Shemp in The Evil Dead, possessed Henrietta in Evil Dead 2, and Ted Hoffman in the Spider-Man trilogy. He later reprised his role as Henrietta in the television series Ash vs. Evil Dead, in which he also played the character Chet Kaminsky. Yeah, he's another, he's like the, he's, he's our generation's Clint Howard. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Uh, <laughs> Ted is also known for his roles as Lieutenant J.G. Tim O'Neill in Sequest DSV and Joxer the Mighty and Xena Warrior Princess and Hercules, a legendary 
Journeys. Oh, yeah, he was a big part on that. Uh, he will be seen in the upcoming feature film Failure, which was shot in one long take. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, it looks interesting. Uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, Rusty Schwimmer was cast as the police woman. It sounds like a, uh, like a sex thing. Hey, give her the old Rusty Schwimmer. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was raised in Chicago. She actually attended New Trier High School in suburban Winnetka with her best friend, actress Virginia Madsen. What? Is she related to David Schwimmer? No. It's not his aunt? No. Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to say no. Uh, the same, I thought about that, and I was like, I don't think so. Uh, she doesn't look anything like him. No. Uh, Nutri High School is where my first college roommate attended. Okay. Uh, Swimmer made her debut in the short film The Dirk Diggler Story in 1988, written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, which was later expanded into Boogie Nights. And I think she was also in Boogie Nights, if uh, I remember pro- correctly. Probably. She had small parts in Highlander 2, The Quickening, Sleepwalkers, yeah. and Candyman before playing Joey B in Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday in 1993. Her titular role. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> For the scene where Helen strips in front of the police woman, Virginia Madsen suggested her lifelong best friend Schwimmer for the part as she felt more comfortable doing it in front of a familiar face. Okay. Uh, with her extremely bloody undergarments. Yeah. Schwimmer has also appeared in guest starring roles in several television series, including... Parker Lewis Can't Lose, In the Heat of the Night, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Tales from the Crypt, Married... With children, ER, Chicago Hope, Ally McBeal, Judging Amy, The X-Files, Gilmore Girls, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, Criminal Minds, Heroes, Desperate Housewives, Boston Legal, Private Practice, Six Feet Under, Drop Dead Diva, Louie, Lucifer, Grey's Anatomy, Bones, and Better Call Saul. She most recently appeared in the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. Yeah, she's great. She's another. She's, she's in like, everything. She's like Xander Berkeley. She shows up everywhere. She's consummate professional. Always delivers. Another one of these great... Journeyman, journey person, yeah, uh, actors, a, a, a character actors yeah. who is in everything and is probably a great person because she's always cast. Now I want to see a movie starring Xander Berkeley and Rusty Schwimmer. <laughs> <laughs> wow, only if you say it that way, Rusty Schwimmer. Uh, so exterior hallway and stairway scenes were actually filmed for a few days in the infamous Cabrini Green housing projects, though the producers had to make a deal with the ruling gang members to put them in the movie as extras to ensure the cast and crew's safety during filming. Yeah, always, when you're a felon, it's always a good idea to put your face on camera. Even with this arrangement, a sniper put a bullet through the production van on the last day of filming, though no one was injured. Yeah, at least they waited till the end. Yeah. The honeybees in Candyman were controlled by Norman Gary, who previously handled the bees on films such as The Deadly Bees in 1966, My Girl in 1991, and Fried Green Tomatoes also in 1991. Yeah, hi, I'm the kind of guy. I handle the bees. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, I got a bunch of bees to kill McKelly Cucklin. Uh, people were really <laughs> upset I'm sorry, about that. I'm sorry, who? McKelly Cucklin. You know, the little boy from Holmes Alone? Yeah, okay. I got him good. Oh, he got a lot he of bees on him. That little boy cried and cried and cried because he got so many stings. The film used more than 200,000 real honeybees throughout, and most of the crew wore bonnie suits to be pr- protected from stings. Yes, you know, uh, just so you know, I named them all. All 200,000 had different distinct names. Some of them, of, I will have to say, were like Johnny the Second or Johnny the Eighth. Uh, despite the body suits, every single person on set received at least one sting. Nice. You ever been yeah. stung by a bee? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When was the last time you were stung by a bee? Um, man, I want to say it was probably when I was like 14. Wow. I, I was uh, working at an amusement park, and it was one of those like glass bottle ring toss games. And there was a bee on there, and I just kind of swung at it, and it just jammed right into my finger. Ooh. You know? I, uh, I, I was re- not recently, but when I used to work for that kid company. Oh, yeah. Amazing Kid Co. or whatever. I was a lifeguard for some <laughs> reason, and uh, a bee landed on my neck and stung me. Oh, wow. wow. It hurt. It yeah. wasn't that bad. I once kneeled on a, a dead bee when I was a little boy, and it stung no, my knee. You. Oh, that, wow. That was sad. Candyman was one of the first movies to use the sky cam for the establish, establishing shot of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, Rose said... We did that with an incredible new machine called the sky cam, which can shoot up to a 500 millimeter lens with no vibration. You've never seen a shot like that before, at least not <laughs> done that smoothly. Yeah. It was great. Like <laughs> it was I, fantastic. I watched the frames to see any jiggle jaggle, it, and it, it was It set such perfect. an amazing tone. Oh, yeah. Like, it's so good. And, again... 
the most copied shot. Yeah. And I would say at this point, probably even more copied than the push pull yeah. Hitchcock. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And I just love the they they'd showed it a couple times, but like it's somewhere at the University of Illinois, Chicago, with that like where it goes way down, yeah. like steps go down. So like but from overhead, it doesn't really look like that. Yeah. So, like, it's just such a weird, like, it just, it adds the eeriness. It's just totally, really cool. Totally, yeah. And it really is a great way of establishing the city as one of the characters. Right. In film. Yeah. When Phil Glass signed, signed on to compose the score for Candyman, he apparently envisioned the final film being something totally different. According to Rolling Stone. What he presumed would be an artful version of Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden, had ended up, in his view. A low-budget slasher. Uh, eh, no. I'm it sorry, wasn't. Phil. I, I, I disagree with Phil Glass. Yes, completely. snob. I mean, look, Phil, you're an extremely talented guy. He is a snob. I, 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 he was reportedly very disappointed in the film and felt that he had been manipulated. You manipulated me. Uh, still, the haunting music is considered a classic score, and Glass's own view of it seems to have softened over time. He has since said, It has become a classic, so I still make money from that score. I get checks every year. Well, it seems like he just uh, likes getting the checks. Well, yeah. I it doesn't mean, seem like he's come around on the movie. No, no of course. And it, Which is, the, the irony is that it, it's... I mean, the movie's great, but the score is one of the best things about the movie. Yep. Like, it fits in so well. Yeah, I get it. I mean, that piano is just so good. I, I yeah. Uh, Candyman, Candyman had its world premiere at the 1992 Toronto International Film Festival, playing as part of the Midnight Madness lineup. Nice. It was released on October 16th in the United States, where it made $25.7 million off a $9 million budget. Not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. There was some controversy that the film was depicting racism and racial stereotypes. According to Rose... I had to go and have a whole set of meetings with the NAACP because the producers were so worried. And what they said to me when they'd read the script was, why are we even having this meeting? You know, this is just good fun. Their argument was, why shouldn't a black character be a ghost? Why shouldn't a black actor play Freddy Krueger or Hannibal Lecter? If you're saying that they can't be, it's really perverse. This is a horror movie. Yeah. I mean, that's what I love about it. The producers were freaked out, and then the NAACP was like, okay. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey. <sighs> it's Bob. Um, hey, Bob. Look, we get really nervous around, quote, unquote, black stuff. <laughs> um, Obviously. Yeah. We don't know very much about it. You know, we try to stay away. But, um, yeah, we were just like, hey, you know. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, why didn't you take that meeting with the NAACP? No, I'm no, no way. No, I'm not. I'm scared of you them. You just made the director go do it. Well, yeah. I don't go and do that kind of stuff. Nobody. You wouldn't even pick up the phone and just call them and go, "Hey, we're doing this movie. Mm, not, Can we get your opinion on I it?" I don't call anything that's not three one zero area code. <laughs> Okay. No two one threes. Definitely no eight one eights. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Okay. Uh, reviews for the film were mixed. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times wrote Elements of the plot may not hold up in the clear light of day, but that didn't bother me much. What I liked was a horror movie that was scaring me with ideas and gore instead of simply with gore. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like he liked it. <laughs> yes, it was a very good horror movie. I think horror movies, you know, they're like the redheaded stepchild of Hollywood. You yeah. Know? At least yeah. back then. Oh, definitely back and, then. And, yeah. you know, there's some, you can do great art in yeah. horror too, oh, you know? Yes. This was a really yes. interesting horror film. It was, yeah. a, it was, it was more of a gothic thriller to me than a horror movie. Yeah, I mean, there's I gore, but it wasn't. You know, oh, chasing was, around a bunch of teenagers. There was gore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Janet Maslin of the New York Times compared it to... An elaborate campfire story. With an... Usually high interest in social issues. Kevin Thomas of the Los, Los Angeles Times called the film Clive Barker's... Worst to date. An ambitious but pretentious film that... Quickly becomes as repellent as it is preposterous. Okay. You know, you're... Hater of joy, my friend. <laughs> so go hate. to your little hate shack and your little hate street and I'm sure, sit in your hate tub. And I'm sure Kevin Thomas had to go confess that he saw this movie to his priest. Yes, eat your hate nuggets. 
Uh, two standalone sequels comprising a single storyline were released. Uh, Candyman Farewell to the Flesh in 1995, directed by Bill Condon, set three years after the original film, which received extremely negative reviews. Yeah. yeah. And Candyman Day of the Dead in 1999, set in 2020 about the daughter of Annie Tarrant and released direct-to-video. So it was the the baby then, right? Yes. Of the Of Anne Marie? Yes, I believe so, yeah. Okay, because I was going to say, Helen didn't have a kid. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It's the daughter. It was the daughter of the, a character that was in Feral the Flesh. Oh, okay. Yeah, not yeah. not the... It would have been interesting if it was Vanessa I, Estelle Williams. Well, that's the thing is that I I thought um, eventually when they do the, the Candyman movie... Like the reboot? The, the, they did the reboot. Mm-hmm. I thought that maybe that the, the baby in that was in the movie, but I... Literally don't remember. I don't either. I kind of want to see it again after seeing I think I'm going to have to. The new one? Uh, Originally, originally Bernard Rose wanted to make a prequel film about Candyman and Helen's love, but the studio turned it down. On August 27th, 2021, a direct sequel to the original 1992 Candyman was released, also called Candyman. Candyman. The film was directed by Nia DaCosta, with a script from Jordan Peele, Wynne Rosenfeld, and Nia DaCosta. Nice. And... What else has Nia DaCosta done? Do you know? No, she did a movie called Little Woods before that. Okay. But, but, uh, but yeah, she's directing the Marvels. Nice. That looks really fun. Um, and she's currently in production on an adaptation of Hedda Gabler. Okay. Uh, like that needed to be made again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the new film in 2021 takes place in the new gentrified Cabrini Green, where the old housing project's development once stood in Chicago. The film stars Yahya Ab- Yaha. Abdul Mateen II as an artist obsessed with the Candyman legend, Tayana Paris, Nathan Stewart Jarrett, and Coleman Domingo with Vanessa Williams, Virginia Madsen, and Tony Todd reprising the roles from the original film. Weird. The film incorporates Tony Todd's backstory for Candyman having an interracial love affair. I'm going to have to watch it again because now that knowing it's a direct sequel yeah. to the original, because I really don't want to watch the other two. No, there's no point. But yeah, the, I, I do want to see it again. I don't remember it at all. It must have been back... During the it, it pandemic was during when we the were drinking a lot. Lockdown. <laughs> lockdown time. I saw a lot of movies that I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, there was some drinking. But uh, I'm so glad that we covered this movie because it was just kind of thrown in the dustbin for me. Yeah. I didn't yeah. remember it very well. Like I said, I thought it took place in New Orleans. Yeah. And yeah. I hadn't probably seen it since the 90s. Um, yeah, I definitely have not seen it since college. So, I mean, I, it's been at least 25 years. And it really holds up. It's a very interesting movie. It's more of kind of a crime thriller than it is a horror yeah. film. It shot so well. Very psychological. I mean, really, you could make the argument that it's all a psychotic break that yeah. Helen has. Yeah. That's the part of it I remembered the least was that they it's literally the Candyman just gaslighting her. Yes. <laughs> making her think that she's been murdering people. That's what we 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 realized that the Candyman invented gaslighting. Yeah. And <laughs> he he basically did that the entire time. And that's a, that was also a cool trope that you hadn't seen too often yeah, in yeah. in horror movies where the final girl or the whatever you want to call yeah. her is actually framed for the murders. Right, right. And, and in a way that is makes it really look like she did do the murders. I mean, yeah. you know, I would say, I would say, Helen, after the first time, maybe don't pick up the murder weapon. <laughs> put your prints all over it, you know? Yeah. Did you learn yeah. your lesson with the cleaver? Yeah. Nope. Don't pick nope. up this knife. Put the prints all over it. And then pick up the murder weapon, Helen, and then stand over the body menacingly. Yeah. Brandish it. Yeah. As because, people come in. Yes, because nobody so they, will. They know. <laughs> hell in hell in But hell it's hell. funny how that it, it translated in the end where I'm pretty sure that they, the her husband's new girlfriend or whatever. Yeah. Her standing there with him dead in the tub holding the knife. Granted, it had no blood on it, but she's probably no, going to get. did have blood on it. That's oh, the thing it? is always. I didn't think at the end, I didn't think the knife she picked up and brought in had blood on it. Maybe not. But the. It doesn't the, matter. Though. What she picked up. This is why I think maybe she did it. Is because, Virginia Madsen yeah. definitely did. Because where did all that blood come from? Exactly. It I wasn't think, hers. Yeah. I think this whole thing was, to me, I think the whole thing is a psychotic break. I thought when she woke up and was like, what the hell's going on? And then sees the dog head and and is like, oh, my God. And then she goes over. I thought she had murdered the baby. Yeah, me and too. that's where all the blood came from. Yeah, and the screams and you know from the, the mother. I yeah. Thought. 
It was um, it was like because she just kept standing over it, like rifling through the blood and stuff in there. But and you know, drop the cleaver, lady. You're not going to do yourselves any favors by cleaving the victim. Yeah. No matter if she's yeah. beating you up or not. <laughs> yeah, I just look more guilty. Uh, maybe I just got to give her a little cleave, just a little cleave to get off of me. Okay. But, you know, even if she did, at the end of the day, she did crawl underneath the giant bonfire Good and Lord. save the baby. Yes, because, I mean, that was the whole thing. I think she put the baby there, yeah. you know, in her psychotic break. She had you to. Know. It's like, yeah. it's like uh, to me, it's very much like Fight Club. Yeah. You know, yeah. where you got the two characters, but it's just one. Right. And they're doing everything to themselves. Uh and but that was just so well done. Her on fire. Oh. It was like watching Darth Vader get burned up at the <laughs> end of episode three. Her coming, they they like put her out with the stuff, and I was like, man, that looked bad. And then they pulled it off, and she had no hair, and it was just like, oh my god, it was all just burnt. <laughs> oh god, the baby, so good. It's such a good movie. I I did not. I am. I have found a newfound love for this. Yeah. It definitely makes me want to watch whatever Jordan Peele saw in this movie sure. and make this direct sequel. Mm-hmm. Like I definitely want to watch that again. Yeah, me too. And I think to watching Tremors and then this, I think horror really hasn't come a long way. Yeah. In terms of being very, I don't know, creative and different like it was back yeah. then. Yeah. And these two movies really stand out as. A, Tremors is a great character study yeah. with great characters and just happen to have some worms after them. <laughs> some graboids. And the same thing, uh, you know, great characters in Candyman. Yeah. Uh, Virginia Madsen is awesome. Tony Todd is awesome. Uh, Casey Lemons and Vanessa Estelle Williams, all amazing. They're both so good. Without that good work and without delving into their characters, it's just another, you know, gory slash or whatever. But right. this had some soul to it and had some depth to it. And it took the, the – the I love movies that take the urban legends and bring them to life in a yeah. very creative way. Yeah. If you're going to do a Slenderman movie and you're just going to make it some slasher, yeah. you know, whatever, then you're, you're, you're not delving into the fun part of urban legend. Right. Right. Which is not so much the murders, yeah. but it's the story leading up to them. Yeah, that yeah. is what makes urban legends. Why? Yeah. Why is last? It? What why? makes an yeah. urban legend yeah. last? And this is a very well told urban legend. Yeah, yeah, it's done extremely well. I, I, uh, I do. I, I, I don't disagree that I, I feel like there is not a lot of very creative horror happening right now. I do find it very. Uh, fitting that it was Jordan Peele involved with yeah. this direct sequel, Candyman, because he is doing really yes. interesting stuff. Well, like I said, Jordan Peele is the new Wes Craven, and Wes Craven was the guy that in- reinvented right. horror every decade. Right. And there's some really great independent stuff being done oh, in yeah. horror. Oh, yeah. But I think a lot of the mainstream stuff is just very glossy, usually PG-13. Yeah. It's some sort of conjuring sequel, you know? There's like 80 different... Well, this is this is we are literally running into. We'll talk about this next week with Scream, but we're literally running into the same problem that the late '80s, early '90s had. Yeah, is that they're just trying to repackage the same story in the same franchise over right. and over and over and over. Yeah, and so like I think mainstream horror has gotten kind of lazy. No, agreed. Um, I, yeah, I, I think this is it's cyclical. I think yeah. this happened in the 80, late '80s and the '90s until Scream, right? Minus these couple of movies, you know. Jordan Peele is elevating horror again to more than just horror. You know, Us and Get Out and what was the Nope? Last? Nope. All really awesome, intriguing, unique horror films that are redefining the genre. Yeah, and yeah. making something. He, Jordan Peele is a definite student of the 70s and a student of uh, older film. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. you can see his influences there. And he is doing something that I think is elevating horror and is going to bring more people, more, you know, uh, res- quote unquote, quote, he's respectable right. directors right. and stuff into horror to do stuff. Because Silence of the Lambs, technically a horror movie. Yeah. It's an Oscar winning movie. Yeah, yeah. It can be done well. It doesn't yeah. have to be schlock. It doesn't have to be lazy. I just, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff being done on the web 
Oh, with yeah. That, uh, Pixel, oh, yeah. what's that guy's name? Uh, Kane Pixels. Yeah, you know, these really weird, unsettling. Oh, there's a few. I've been I've been keeping track of stuff. We'll talk to her about it during the Stepdad Show, but just some really good, like, independent YouTube stuff that is really eerie and very unsettling. I think that we're heading into a, a more golden era again of yeah. horror movies, mm-hmm. you know, where we're going to get away from... You know, although they're doing more Scream movies and they're sure. doing more Conjuring movies and they do all that stuff, like, they're, we're, we're getting into to, to studios willing to take more risks. Right, or at least independence. You know, you yeah. got A24, which is putting out really good work, yeah. or Blumhouse oh, yeah. is putting yeah. out really good stuff. Um, I'm really excited to see The Boogeyman, the, yeah. the yeah. Stephen King thing. I'm, I want to watch that. Um, it's just really, it, it's really refreshing to go into something for the show and kind of having a, preconceived notion that yeah. I didn't really like this movie. That's the first thing I said to you when we sat down to watch it. I was like, I don't remember really liking this very much. And I was totally wrong. Yeah. And then being completely surprised and completely yeah. turned around. And I think we're also at that age and at that time in our lives where you want to, either you're bitter and, and hate everything or yeah. you realize how hard it is to do anything and you really want to like stuff because yeah. you know the effort that went into it. Right. Um, we tease a lot and we make fun, but we also know how difficult it is to do oh, this. Yeah. And, you know, for every Candyman, you know, there's a thousand different. Fr- Friday the 13th, Jason Goes to Hell. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> boy. Or Jason X. Jason X. Um, but yeah. do yourself a yeah. favor. If you haven't seen this movie. Find it. Yeah. Watch it again because it really holds up and it's a very unique film in the horror canon in terms of race and location mm-hmm. and backstory and urban legend and bees bees. lots of bees uh so check it out watch it uh we'll be back next week we're gonna cover the granddaddy of all 90s horror movies what's your favorite scary movie (laughs) welcome to the next one yeah okay well it's the first time in a while you've messed that up it's because i had a 12 ounce red bull you d- oh, you did? Yeah, I, I don't Lord. know how that's going to go. I, I got to send you a, drugs. saw a great article this morning about overconsumption of caffeine. Well, too late. A film that critic... Wow. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Taxi. Already in progress.